Hi, today we will be discussing gastrointestinal bleeding as discussed in Chapter 44 of Harrison's Principles of Internal Medicine. Gastrointestinal bleeding is one of the most common gastrointestinal conditions leading to hospitalization in the United States. Before we begin, it is important for us to be familiar with the terms used in the discussion. Overt gastrointestinal bleeding means there is obvious evidence of bleeding. Under this are different conditions such as hematemesis, which means vomitus of red blood or coffee ground material. Melena is when the patient passes black tarry stools. Hematochesia is the passage of red or maroon blood from the rectum. These three signs fall under overt gastrointestinal bleeding. Occult gastrointestinal bleeding, on the other hand, is bleeding from the GI tract without obvious evidence of bleeding and may just present with symptoms of blood or uh, symptoms of blood loss or anemia, such as lightheadedness, syncope, angina or dyspnea, or laboratory evidence of iron deficiency anemia, or a positive occult blood test. In discussing GI bleeding, the location is also vital in deciding how to proceed with diagnosis and management. Upper gastrointestinal bleeding is bleeding that comes from the esophagus, stomach, or duodenum. Lower gastrointestinal bleeding is bleeding that comes from the small intestine or colon. Obscure GI bleeding is when the source of bleeding is unclear. In upper gastrointestinal bleeding, peptic ulcers are the most common cause. Features of an ulcer at endoscopy provide important prognostic information that guides subsequent management decisions. An endoscopic classification for ulcers is used to assess risk of rebleeding and management decision. This classification is called the forest classification as shown on this table. This flowchart shows the recommended approach depending on the forest classification. In summary, bleeding ulcers with the highest risk of findings, such as forest 1A and B and 2A and B, often benefit from endoscopic therapy with bipolar electrocoagulation, heater probe, injection therapy, and or clips with reductions in bleeding, hospital stay, mortality, and costs. In contrast, patients with forest classification 2C or 3 if stable and with no other reason for hospitalization, may be discharged home after endoscopy. Apart from endoscopic hemostasis, medical management with a proton pump inhibitor or PPI is also recommended. Randomized controlled trials document that high dose, constant infusion PPI administered as an 80 mg bolus followed by an 8 mg per hour infusion designed to sustain intragrastic pH more than 6 and enhance clot stability, decrease further bleeding and mortality in patients with high-risk ulcers when given after endoscopic therapy. Recent meta-analysis, though, show that high-dose intermittent PPIs are non-inferior to constant infusion PPI therapy. Patients with lower risk findings do not require endoscopic therapy and receive standard doses of oral PPI. Prevention of recurrent bleeding focuses on three main factors in ulcer pathogenesis. Eradication of H. pylori in patients with bleeding ulcers decreases bleeding risk to less than 5%. If bleeding ulcer develops in patients taking non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or NSAIDs, then the NSAIDs should be discontinued. They should be given a COX-2 selective NSAID plus a PPI is recommended. Patients with established cardiovascular disease who develop bleeding ulcers while taking low-dose aspirin should restart aspirin as soon as possible after their bleeding episode within one to seven days. 
Patients with bleeding ulcers unrelated to H. pylori or NSAIDs should remain on PPI therapy indefinitely, given a 42% incidence of re-bleeding at seven years. Mallory Y. stairs have a classic history of vomiting, retching, or coughing preceding hematemesis, especially in an alcoholic patient. Bleeding from these stairs, which are usually on the gastric side of the gastroesophageal junction, stops spontaneously in 80 to 90% of patients. Endoscopic therapy is indicated only if actively bleeding. Another etiology of upper GI bleeding is esophageal varices. Patients with variceal hemorrhage have poorer outcomes compared with other sources of upper GI bleeding. Urgent endoscopy within 12 hours is recommended. And if esophageal varices are present, endoscopic ligation should be performed. An IV vasoactive medication such as octreotide, somatostatin, vapriotide, terlipressin is given for two to five days. In bleeding esophageal varices, Combination of endoscopic and medical therapy is superior to either therapy alone in decreasing rebleeding. Over the long term, treatment with non selective beta blockers plus endoscopic ligation is recommended because the combination is more effective than either alone in reduction of recurrent esophageal variceal bleeding. Transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunting or TIPS is recommended in patients who have persistent or recurrent bleeding despite endoscopic and medical therapy. It should also be considered in the first one to two days of hospitalization for acute variceal bleeding in patients with advanced liver disease, such as those that fall under child PUC. Portal hypertension is also responsible for bleeding from gastric varices, varices in the small and large intestine, and portal hypertensive gastropathy and enterocolopathy. Bleeding gastric varices are treated with endoscopic injection of tissue adhesive if available. If not, TIPS is performed. In erosive disease, erosions are endoscopically visualized breaks which are confined to the mucosa and do not cause major bleeding due to the absence of arteries and veins in the mucosa. Erosions in the esophagus, stomach, or duodenum commonly cause mild upper GI bleeding. The most important cause of gastric and duodenal erosions is NSAID use. Other causes of gastric erosions include alcohol intake, H. pylori infection, and stress-related injury. Stress-related gastric mucosal injury occurs in extremely sick patients, such as those who have experienced serious trauma, major surgery, burns covering more than a third of the body surface area, major intracranial disease, or severe medical illness. Pharmacologic prophylaxis with PPI may be considered in these patients. Meta-analysis of randomized trials indicate that PPI are more effective than H2 receptor antagonists in reduction of overt and clinically important upper GI bleeding without differences in mortality or nosocomial pneumonia. Other possible causes of upper GI bleeding are listed here. Patients without a source of GI bleeding identified on upper endoscopy and colonoscopy were previously labeled as having obscure GI bleeding. With the advent of improved diagnostic modalities, approximately 75% of GI bleeding previously labeled obscure is now estimated to originate in the small intestine beyond the extent of a standard upper endoscopic exam. Small intestinal bleeding may account for up to 5 to 10% of GI bleeding cases. The most common causes in adults more than 40 years old are vascular ectasia, neoplasm, and NSAID-induced erosions and ulcers. In less than 40 years old are Crohn's disease, polyposis syndrome, and neoplasm.
Meckel's diverticulum is the most significant cause of small intestinal bleeding in children. Less common causes which usually occur in patients less than 40 years old are as follows. For colonic sources of bleeding, hemorrhoids are probably the most common cause of lower GI bleeding. Anal fissures are also cause minor bleeding and pain. If these local anal processes, which rarely require hospitalization, are excluded, the most common cause of lower GI bleeding in adults is diverticulosis, followed by vascular ectasias especially in the proximal colon of patients above 70 years old, neoplasms, colitis, post-polypectomy bleeding, and radiation proctopathy. Rare causes of lower GI bleeding are the following. In children and adolescents, the most common colonic causes of significant GI bleeding are inflammatory bowel disease and juvenile polyps. Diverticular bleeding is abrupt in onset, usually painless, sometimes massive, and often from the right colon. Chronic or occult GI bleeding is not characteristic of diverticular bleeding. It stops bleeding spontaneously in approximately 80 to 90% of patients and on long-term follow-up, re-bleed in about 15 to 40%. When diverticular bleeding is found at angiography, transcatheter arterial embolization by superselective technique stops bleeding in a majority of patients. Segmental surgical resection is recommended for persistent or refractory diverticular bleeding. Bleeding from colonic vascular ectasias may be overt or occult and tends to be chronic and only occasionally is hemodynamically significant. Treatment includes endoscopic hemostatic therapy and transcatheter arterial embolization. Surgical therapy is generally required for major, persistent, or recurrent bleeding from colonic sources that cannot be treated medically endoscopically or angiographically. Next part is to discuss the approach to the patient who presents with GI bleeding. For the initial assessment, measurement of the heart rate and blood pressure is the best way to initially assess a patient with GI bleeding. Clinically significant bleeding leads to postural changes in heart rate or blood pressure, then tachycardia, and finally, recumbent hypotension. Take note that hemoglobin does not fall immediately. Thus, hemoglobin may be normal or minimally decreased at initial presentation of a severe bleeding episode. As extravascular fluid enters the vascular space to restore the volume, the hemoglobin falls, but this process may take up to 72 hours. Transfusion is recommended only when the hemoglobin drops below 7 grams per deciliter. Remember also that patients with slow chronic GI bleeding may have very low hemoglobin values despite normal blood pressure and heart rate. Next step is to differentiate between upper and lower GI bleeding. Hematemesis indicates an upper GI source. Melena indicates blood has been in the GI tract for more than or equal to 14 hours and as long as 3 to 5 days. The more proximal the bleeding site, the more likely melena will occur. Hematochesia usually represents a lower GI bleed. But an upper GI lesion may bleed so briskly that blood transits the bowel very quickly before melena develops. When hematochesia is the presenting symptom of upper GI bleeding, it is associated with hemodynamic instability and a dropping hemoglobin. Bleeding lesions of the small bowel may present as melena or hematochesia. Other clues to upper GI bleeding include hyperactive bowel sounds and an elevated BUN. In the evaluation and management of upper GI bleeding, 
Baseline characteristics predictive of pre bleeding and death are hemodynamic compromise, such as tachycardia and hypotension, increasing age, and comorbidities. An example of a risk assessment tool that can be used is the Glasgow Blatchford score. Discharge from the emergency room without patient management has been suggested for patients with Glasgow Blatchford score of 0 to 1 or 0 to 2 among patients less than 70 years old. This slide shows you the components of the scale and the corresponding scores for each component. In managing a patient with possible upper GI bleeding, PPI infusion may be considered at initial presentation as it decreases high risk ulcer stigmata and need for endoscopic therapy, although it does not improve clinical outcomes such as further bleeding, surgery, or death. The promotility agent erythromycin at 250 milligrams IV can be administered around 30 minutes before endoscopy to improve visualization at endoscopy. Cirrhotic patients presenting with upper GI bleeding should be given an antibiotic, either a quinolone or ceftriaxone, and IV vasoactive medication upon presentation, even before endoscopy. The antibiotics decrease bacterial infections, rebleeding, and mortality, and vasoactive medications may improve control of bleeding in the first 12 hours of presentation. Upper endoscopy should be performed within 24 hours in most patients with upper GI bleeding. Patients at higher risk, such as those with hemodynamic instability or have cirrhosis, may benefit from urgent endoscopy within the first 12 hours. Early endoscopy is also beneficial in low-risk patients for management decisions such as planning for discharge. Patients with major bleeding and high-risk endoscopic findings such as varices or ulcers with active bleeding or a visible vessel may benefit from endoscopic hemostatic therapy. Whereas patients with low-risk lesions such as clean-based ulcers, erosions, or non-bleeding malarowai stairs who have stable vital signs and hemoglobin and no other medical problems may be discharged. In the evaluation and management of lower GI bleeding, patients with hematochesia and hemodynamic instability should have upper endoscopy first to rule out an upper GI source before evaluation of the lower GI tract. Colonoscopy is the procedure of choice in most patients admitted for lower GI bleeding unless bleeding is too massive, in which case angiography is recommended. CT angiography is often suggested prior to angiography to document evidence and location of active bleeding, after which conventional angiography can be carried out, and when it detects the site of bleeding, embolization can be done to control the bleeding. In patients with no source of bleeding identified on colonoscopy RBC or RBC tagging, in patients with no source of bleeding identified on colonoscopy, RBC tagging may be done, and this allows repeated imaging for up to 24 hours and may identify the general location of the bleeding. In patients with small intestinal or obscure GI bleeding, Current guidelines suggest angiography as the initial test, with CT angiography or RBC tagging prior to angiography if the patient's clinical status permits. For others, repeat upper and lower endoscopy may be considered as the initial evaluation because second look procedures identify a source in up to 25% of cases. A push enteroscopy may be done to inspect the entire duodenum and the proximal jejunum. If second look procedures are negative, evaluation of the entire small intestine is performed usually with video capsule endoscopy. Capsule endoscopy, however, 
does not allow full visualization of the small intestines, tissue sampling, or application of therapy. CT enterography may be used initially instead of video capsule in patients with possible small bowel narrowing, such as a stricture, a prior surgery or radiation, or Crohn's disease, and may follow a negative video capsule for suspected small intestinal GI bleeding given its higher sensitivity for small intestinal masses. Deep enteroscopy is commonly the next step undertaken for clinically important GI bleeding documented or suspected to be from the small intestines because it allows the endoscopist to examine, obtain specimens from and provide therapy to much or all of the small intestines. If all the tests are unrevealing, intraoperative endoscopy is indicated. Fecal occult blood testing is recommended only for colorectal cancer screening beginning at age 50 in average risk individuals. A positive test necessitates colonoscopy. If negative, further workup is not recommended unless the patient has iron deficiency anemia or if GI symptoms are present. This slide shows the suggested algorithm for patients with acute upper GI bleeding based on endoscopic findings. This slide shows the suggested algorithm for patients with acute lower GI bleeding. This ends our discussion on gastrointestinal bleeding.